Six Degrees of Separation is down at the ASB Waterfront Theatre from the 14th to the 29th of August. And it's described as a dramedy, which we'll explore in a moment with our wonderful guests. It's the sixth show in Auckland Theatre Company's 2019 season. And it's based on real life events in suave, very sophisticated and extremely wealthy Manhattan. Here to tell us about it, two of the actors in it, Jennifer Ford Leland and Mark Wright. Welcome. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora. You are among the most suave and the most sophisticated oh. and probably the most wealthy of the of the characters. I, I am. You're yes. Louisa, known I'm, as Weezer. That's right. And my husband is Flanders, Flan. And, and he's, he's an art dealer. He's an art dealer. Mm. One of those private art dealers, the people who don't have a gallery, but they sell privately from their home. So, you know, you get one painting, you get a whole lot of buyers buying it, and then you sell it on, in their case, to the Japanese or the Germans or... Cool. So are they very witty, very quick-witted, that, that kind of New York... Um... Yeah, it's that they're, they're urbane. Um, I, I talked to a friend of mine who lived in New York at that time. She said that there was a, uh, an air of desperation with these people because they were literally six months away from losing everything. But the whole facade that they had to keep up was uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, going to all the right places, being seen at the right places, meeting all the right people, being on the right boards, you know. Uh, but really it was about selling that work and making sure you could keep funding that lifestyle. What did they say in the play? Um, uh, hand to mouth on a higher plateau. It's <laughs> yes. gorgeous. And Mark, who are you in the play? I play Larkin, who's a, a friend of the Kittredges. Um, he uh, heads a foundation, uh, so it's a not-for-profit charitable foundation. Um, I think perhaps trying to social climb slightly to be up with the Kittredges, but, but it's all about it is all about the society for them. It's, it's um, climbing the social ladder, really. This big noting. So into this mm. brittle world that looks terribly established and like it's well set up comes a character who is somehow linked with Sidney Poitier. So tell us yes, about this. Yes, so young Paul arrives saying that he's a friend of our children from Harvard. And we believe him, like you would. And remember, this is 1990, mm. pre-cell phones. Yeah. Now we'd probably text and say, hey, we've a young Yeah, no that. social media. No. Yeah, and of course, really, it's landline. You ring your children, you never get hold of them. They're in their wherever, dorm room or mm. whatever. Uh, and, uh, and he turns up saying that he's a friend and, and is extraordinary and witty and charming. And as my character says, he did more for us in a couple of hours than our children ever did. He's completely <laughs> enchanting. And... Uh, he ends up staying the night, and yes, he says he's the son of Sidney Poitier. And Which course, is fascinating because fascinating. Sidney Poitier was in the in the sixties movie Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. That's right. And this this play itself is a commentary on race relations, isn't it? It is, and uh, and of course, the idea of us being in the movies or close to stardom mm. is very attractive for mm. all of us. You know, to actually know someone who is one degree of separation from Sidney Poitier, hello, you know, it'd be like saying, oh, Mark's just close friends with George Clooney and you might just suddenly want to go around to dinner at Mark's place. You, know. you are, aren't you, Mark? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, that, and that, I think, is the one uh, connection with now and back in 1990, I think, with, with the social media, we have that, that celebrity status, that being famous just for being famous, and, uh, and nothing's changed in, in human relations in that sense, is that a lot of the play is a, is built on the fact that these these people want to have a story that they can dine out on. Um, it's the and perfect opening for a con. For yes, a, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and um, you know, we love an anecdote that yes. we can have at, at, at our wonderful dinner parties and, and, and flip off in the foyer of an art, uh, you know, at the Metropolitan Opera or the, the art gallery, whatever. Um, but my character gets very... It's an experience for her. She is deeply affected by this young man and she doesn't want it to be just an anecdote. She wants to, she wants to make some sense of what, what has happened because obviously they find out yes. that he's not yeah. the son of Sydney. So what's its, what's its message? I mean, I know that the, the phrase six degrees of separation came from this play. Yes, it but did. But what would you say the underlying message is? And then you, Mark, uh, or is there not one? Is uh, it just an yes, exploration? Yes, there is. I mean, I think it's about... He's playing, a, he's playing a role, but so are we. We're just on another, on another echelon. Yes. Um, and who's, who's hiding what from who? I suppose I think there's a lot of that in there. But I think one of the most fabulous things about working on the show is the whip-smart dialogue. It's funny, it's, it's sharp, 
it's searing at times and it just goes like like the clappers. It's incredibly satisfying to perform. You have to be very, very focused. Because brilliance in New York is truly brilliant. They're yes. high, brilliant. They're highly educated. It's such a competitive world. Yes. They have to be funnier than the rest. So it's got yes. that tightness of dialogue. We have an opening scene where we have uh, Jeffrey, who's our friend from South Africa, and we want him to put in some money for this, for this um, piece of artwork that we need to get. We need his money. But you know, so there's a sense of sort of auditioning, the sense of, of making everything very fabulous for Jeffrey, so that he, you know, has this incredible ex New York experience and wants to give us his money. Into that comes Paul. Paul. Do you do you love Louisa? Do you love her character? I do. I do. Because what do you love about? I, her? I love it that she um, that she changes. She is changed in some way, and she starts looking at at how shallow her life is. She says, "How much of your life can you account for? Not not much, but that." changed me that was an experience that boy and I want to help him oh that's intriguing mm. so Mark the, what would you the, say the, yeah the, uh, the, the the sort of themes for you what do you see coming through oh, obviously racism but um I, I find it that um again even though it's you know nearly 30 years old uh the parallels between what's going on our, we're, our children are at at school together um and we we get to meet and so there's that a uh, big generation gap and you see the entitlement in oh. our children and yes. it's no different than what's happening now I think in high society also art I see in this play is is treated like a commodity like oil or diamonds it's yes. it's traded for them to, to make money so there's a whole commentary about when is art for art's sake and when it's to make money mm. of it there's that mm. uh, the whole class there is the we go from homeless street kid to Fifth Avenue apartment overlooking Central Park. Mm. So there's all that as well. Um, I think there's a, a myriad of things. And at the, at the commentary at the time, and it's at a time when the Berlin Wall had, had just come down, you've got apartheid in South Africa, you've got Tiananmen Square. And so the, the world is changing, and there's comment on that as well. It's changing Cautious. at that point. Mm. Um, and it's just post the '87 crash as well. Yes. Mm. So, yeah. so people, so people had realised then money wasn't the be all and end all. Mm. But mm. Mm. and lies. they are, they are. The Kittredges are, are one deal away from having to move out of their Fifth Avenue apartment mm. effectively. And mm. there is a real commentary, actually, when you think about it, Mike, about Instagram because that's all smoke and mirrors as well. Yeah. All the mm. followers I have and yeah. how popular I am, and that can all go poof in a moment. Yes, yeah. isn't there, wasn't there that scam of a woman who had a whole? She was an influencer, you know, she had a whole lot of followers, and she decided to do a big happening, where all the influ all the people who loved her would come from all over the world to be at her dinner. Well, it was poorly organised. They sort of had a sandwich and a you know glass of water sort of thing, and it wasn't the big event that she'd made it for because. She was, a, there was no substance. It's no There was substance. nothing there. Mm. But I think my character sees substance in Paul. Although he has learned it all, he has uh, mimicked it all, he, there's more to him than, um, than just a show that he's put on, and I see that. So tell us about the playwright. What do you know about the playwright? Well, I do know that he based this on um, a real incident. His yes, name so is David Ham well, David Gu um, John Gua is, John the, Gua, is yes. the author, is the mm. playwright, and it was based on uh, a, a true incident in New York in the I think around the late eighties. A man called David Hampton who did a not dissimilar thing. He he wasn't from he wasn't down and out this this young mm. man. He was from a fairly middle class um, midwestern uh, town. And, but he decided he wanted more, that there was more to be had. And, and I guess the other interesting thing when you say about themes is what is more? And actually our more is probably as shallow as anybody else's. It looks good. Mm -hmm. It looks great. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're living this sort of rarefied existence. But actually how much meaning is there in it? It's, mm. I mean, it's the ultimate thing, isn't it? When you're on your deathbed and think, oh my God, I missed it. I can't take any of this with yeah, me. Yeah. So, so it's, it's confronting these characters now. Yeah. But I love what you say that there's a transformative part to at least some of the characters. Absolutely, absolutely a transformation yes. for my character. Yeah, really interesting Thinking role that to sort play. of everything was together and realising that they don't, re these people don't have a relationship with their children. No. As Mark said, they're horribly entitled. Yes. They've had everything handed to them. The adults and the children. The, the, children, the children in particular. Are. Yes. So, mm. so you know, we don't have a relationship with them, but I felt like I had a relationship with this young man. 
This, this is the New Zealand premiere of, of the play. Exciting. Very exciting. But is it still going over in, on Broadway? Is it's it still had some going revivals, yes. Yeah. It had, and it's funny to think, you know, 1990, I like to think that that was only 15, 20 years ago, <laughs> but it's not. Um, and, um, you know, we can, we, but we did have to sort of go on the phones. God, how do we hold a call? Yes, you know, yes. everything is so different, technology. So there have been some revivals. But um, about five years ago, uh, Victor Roger chose this as the play that had most influenced him, New Zealand playwright Victor Roger. Uh, and ATC, and I was a member of that cast, did a public reading for the Writers' Festival. And it got a terrific response, and it was wonderful to read this, this work out. And when Colin Because was, of that pacing, that snappiness, yeah, that beautiful it, writing. It's incredible. Yeah. And uh, when Colin was looking for the right play to put into this slot, he remembered that. And um, I'm so so happy that he chose to program it. I wonder why Victor felt that. Of all the theatre um, well, that he could have been Well, again, influenced. you've got a, um, a black man at the centre of it. True. Uh, uh, making put, an impact. Yes, mm. putting himself in another Changing world. a perspective. Yes. Yeah. Uh, making yeah. us question things. Interesting, because Victor is so into the whole Pacifica voice. So yes. This is very much an American voice. But it's universal too, isn't it, Mark? I mean, it's, it's what you're yeah, saying. I was, I was very Kiwis. fortunate to actually be in New York in 91, and I saw uh, the production of it at the Lincoln Center. Who was in that? Who Stockard was Channing was in... Jennifer's role. Wow. Who then played it in the movie, obviously. With Will Smith and um, Donald in the movie, Sutherland. Yes. Donald Sutherland yeah. in the movie, yeah. yes. And I, I remember it, it's a long time ago, but I remember it uh, because I'd never seen a play uh, at that stage uh, uh, that broke the fourth wall so much. Um, Explain a, that for we, people yeah, who don't understand the, that. We are telling the story. Well, Flan and Louisa are telling their story, and they virtually are uh, involving the audience. They they tell the story to the audience, and we yes, and we all do at some mm. point. Um, so it's like we're sharing this dinner party story. Yes. And I I remember sitting there uh, in the theatre and thinking they're talking this Stockard Channing's talking straight to me. It's like it's beautiful. It's but then that's the Shakespearean thing. That's Iago and Othello, isn't exactly. it? I mean, yeah. he does yeah. a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. And we were going, are... and then beautiful. this happened. We were doing this, and then this happened, beautiful. right? And we're back to the character. What about that? So we often. I'm know, really looking forward to it. So just um, in terms of acting, both of you, have you have you worked together before much? Yes, a long time ago. We worked uh, with uh, Colin McColl, the director of this, at Downstage. Yes. Uh, some plays there. And the then the I think opera. the last time, I think, was uh, Rocky Horror when we toured. That's right. But oh, that's, that's 1995, five. so that is a while ago. That's right. Mm. And what are you working on after this, Jennifer? Because you always have three or four uh, things on the go, don't yes, you? Yes, yes. Well, I'll be directing out at Te Po Theatre doing uh, some work for the Kawanga Festival there. And uh, I've got a trip overseas for the International Federation of Actors Executive Meeting in Vancouver. Wow. And um, yeah, and then some interesting things that I can't talk about next year. Maybe you can come back and talk about the um, Federation of Actors thing when you've done it. Love to. That would be lovely. Thank and you. the others. And say a little bit in Tereo. I always do this to you when oh, you come in. Oh, just... I love it. 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 Beautiful. And what you said? I said, well, thank you. Thank you to our, our reporter here Beautiful. and for having us here to, to have a conversation, uh, having Mark and I here to have a conversation. You're with so you. inspiring. Uh -huh. I'm going to do full te reo one year. I'm just going to immerse myself. That, that, is, that is the inspiration. Mark, I've got a very special link with you and I am going to reveal it now. We used to flat together years ago. Yes, we were, we did. Boy, can I, was, I tell you stories? <laughs> I, was, I was a young law student and Mark was a young actor just out of acting, acting school, mm. doing very well. Lovely to see see you again. Lovely to see you both. Thank you for having us. Kia ora. Thank you. <laughs>